Good evening, and welcome back to Smashing the Consensus, the interview show that talks to and interviews people who have stories, books, opinions, that the mainstream media would much rather you didn't hear or see. We don't agree. Tonight, I am joined by that towering figure, Professor Jared Casey, who has, as part of his trilogy on, if you like, modern issues, last September, published his book called Hidden Agenda, Transgender St uh, Struggle with Reality. Now, and I will keep saying this, the book is available both on Amazon and Book Depository, but, and buy it there. But also, please, go into your bookshop and poke them and ask them why it's not on the shelf. Professor Casey, good evening. Thanks good for... evening to you, Paddy, and thank you for having me on. Absolute pleasure, as always. Could I, could I just want to make one small correction before we start? The, the writing of the book was finished in September, but the book actually didn't come out until March of this year. Ah, that, that's even better. So <laughs> it's still very, it, it's not exactly hot on the press, it's kind of warm in the press. <laughs> oh, no, I think the issues, the very issues and the writing make this hot. This is, a, it's not a massive book, but in terms of scholarship, it's a hefty tome. I mean, I've counted 21 pages of references at the back of the book. That's just me showing off. No, I read the book and your, your command of the sources, it's immense. I and mean, this is an area which I'm reasonably familiar with and, and you have stuff I've never experienced or, or, or heard of before. This is a fantastic book. First question I'd like to ask you is why? What's the genesis for this? Where does this book come from? Why are you writing this at this point? What have written this at this point? The, the short answer is probably insanity. Uh, <laughs> it would be quite prevalent among professors. If you're to be and, a, and, and, a desire, and a desire to have punishment inflicted on me. Uh, no, but more seriously, um, some years ago, I started thinking about these issues and uh, they, they, all, they were all sort of stuck together, as it were. Uh, and I started researching and kind of writing in a half-hearted way. And uh, the year before I started this research project, project, I had published Freedom's Progress, which if anyone's been foolish enough to buy it or even worse still read it, is like, is almost a thousand pages. Uh, it will give you both a physical and a mental hernia. So <laughs> the, the, the publisher uh, wasn't, if you like, let's say ecstatic about the idea of publishing this, another gigantic book. And as I started r researching this whole area, not just transgender, but, but feminism, late, late generation feminism and the whole diversity, inclusion and equality agenda and all of that stuff, um, I, I kind of disentangled it. So the, the first book to be published in 2019 is called Zap and, and it's on uh, freedom of speech and positively and negatively it's it's an attack on the whole what i call <laughs> die diversity inclusion and equality i call people who push that diehards so it's an attack on diehardness so that was that the next one was a an attack on late generation feminism in especially in its um, manifestation in the me too movement and the chilling uh push for effectively reversing the the burden of proof in criminal cases particularly in rape cases where the presumption is that you're going to be guilty unless you can demonstrate that you're not and i argue that this is actually dangerous it not only in that particular case but in fact it's destructive of our entire legal system so that was that that came out in 2020 and then that left the transgender material and and that's uh, so that's basically how i how I came to write these. Yeah. That's wonderful. I am going to be horrible and backtrack to the thousand page uh, Freedom's Progress, <laughs> which I heartily recommend to our audience to buy. Uh, it's a tremendous book. Uh, the writing's fantastic. And as I pointed out in an interview with before, it's actually funny. <laughs> uh, there's, it, it's an entertaining read. Uh, I didn't find I got a mental hernia from reading it. Uh, <laughs> I'm very fond of the book. Those those points are really interesting on the the where this comes from. I think it's it, it's somewhat useful that the final one was the transgender issue because we seem to have moved beyond me too. The the movement seems to have 
collapsed upon itself. Um, but the transgender issue is hotter, bigger, and heavier in a way than ever. Mm. This is where we are. Now, this book does some really interesting things. And the first thing is you take it seriously, mm. intellectually. Now, you describe some of what they do in, in, in a wonderful way. You say it's logically incoherent was rhetorically ineffective, uh, rhetorically effective. And that's what you describe as the sex and gender two-step. Can you explain that to us? <laughs> Let's see. Um, I said, once upon a time, I, I say in the book, we used to have sex. Those are the days. <laughs> what I meant, uh, everybody understood what it was. There were two sexes, there were male and female. You have intersex, obviously, and I deal with that in the book. This is after the sort of in around the time of the Beatles first MP, I take it. <laughs> yeah, well, even a little bit earlier for me, Patty, you're being very generous. <laughs> okay. well, I, but, uh, I know, I, I get the reference. Um, so, yeah, and then, so this notion of gender, uh, which originally, has, which has this origin actually in linguistics to describe the classification of nouns and pronouns, um, was adopted in about the 1950s and then in the 60s, it became, if you like, a staple of the women's liberation movement and then feminism. And the, it, in a sort of original meaning, I, I think I'm correct in saying this, it meant something like the following. Uh, yes, there were two sexes, but, uh, and that's, you know, one or the other, okay, it's, it's sort of black and white on this. But in terms of gender, in terms of your sort of masculinity or femininity, that could that could be said to be sort of positioned on the spectrum right and if that's what you mean by it that's not unreasonable no, no, right? no. okay so i don't have i don't have a problem with that the problem is that the if you want to make use if sex and gender are going to be effective as two different terms they have to refer to two different realities okay and the problem is in the current discussions they slip and slide so, for example, if people say, oh, well, we can have lots of genders, and I say, and I'm saying, well, of course, I don't really care. What does it matter to me, right? <laughs> okay. But then, then it turns out what they mean is we can have many sexes. And I'm going, well, no, you can only have two. And, and when you, you find on an official form or quasi-official form where it now puts gender, I always strike that out, by the way, okay? But whenever it says gender, they mean male or female. But, not, but increasingly, now it's a third option or neutral or whatever it might be. And so you get what I call the bait and switch. Whenever the discussion is about sex, gender is brought in and you get the whole thing on the spectrum. And then whenever you object, when, you know, so you go from sex to gender, from gender to sex. And the most egregious instance of this is in the Gender Recognition Acts, both our own domestic one here in Ireland and in the UK, where... If, if you can, I need to read this because Please do. Please other do. People, pe people would think I'm making this up. So this is in the Irish statute book and it says, now listen to this, um, where a, and I'm going to stress the words gender and sex here so that people can get the, 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 the bait and switch, where a gender recognition certificate is issued to a person, the person's gender from that date of that issue become for all purposes, the preferred gender so that if the preferred gender is the male gender, the person's sex becomes that of a man. And if it is the female gender, the person's sex becomes that of a woman. Well, hang on a second. This is either a stunningly careless piece of legal draftsmanship, or it's quite a deliberate piece of obfuscation because if the end result of the issuing of these certificates is to change one's sex, then the name of the act should be the Sex Recognition Act and not the Gender Recognition Act, okay? But this is only one of the many instances, and that's obviously the most important one, where we slip and slide between sex and gender. And of course, the Gender Recognition Act, the Irish, that incredible piece of legislation, which was pushed through Don Aaron in a single afternoon, Four days after the marriage referendum. Um, what a shock. <laughs> uh, which I had predicted, I had said, because I had watched the transgender activists disappear from the marriage debate because they were a burden to the other side. Um, 
contains, interestingly, an in-camera review. What an odd thing in a, in a democracy. That sex and gender two-step, you pull apart brilliantly, as I would expect from a cisgender privileged man writing on this issue. Don't forget why. You, you, you lay out, I've just assumed your gender, uh, you lay out four points uh, that sort of underpin, if you like, the logic of our approach, sort of a reasonable person's approach to sex, the terms sex and gender. Sex and gender are exactly the same. Sex and gender are not the same, maybe related, but this is whether they're one is biological, one is psychosocial. Sex and gender are not the same, may not be related, but this time gender is the fundamental, not sex. Sex and gender are not only not the same, but neither of them are in any way fundamental. And you bring up that wonderful term, performative. <laughs> Sex and gender are performative. Now, you mentioned, and I think she's a figure worth, worth mentioning, that the third wave feminist Judith Butler, but what is performative? How, how is that? What does that mean? Well, in a way, you're asking the wrong guy, because I, I it's a far, I want to be charged. <laughs> to ask for our audience. <laughs> I want to be charitable. So I think it means something like the following. Um, okay. Uh, you get up in the morning and it's spring and you've been, you know, you've been wearing your long woolly underwear all winter and so on. So you've, you, you kind of dress up spring-like and you present yourself in this you know, light colored pastel shades and so on. You present yourself in a certain sort of way. And, oh, that, <laughs> and that night when you go to a party, you dress up in a different way. And the next day when you go to the office, you dress in another way. And these are all, as it were, different presentations of yourself. Yes. None, of which, none of which is more basic or substantial than any other. And anyone, and you can, you are free to present yourself in any way that you choose. And so I think the analogy here is that on the, on the fourth option, which to me is really bizarre, is that both your gender and your sex, which may have nothing to do with each other, but then again, they may, depends on what you want, what your purposes are in your argument. Your day. Uh, yeah, indeed. So you, you, as it were, perform in a certain way, you present yourself in a certain way, and that's your gender, or you do the same. And this is the even more radical one. You can actually performatively present yourself sexually, in, sorry, in a sex, right? which to me is completely baffling. And uh, it's so, so anti-scientific, by the way, that, that the mind boggles. And that is a basic point that you make, that biology, biology of mammals, has a basic physical reality. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, the basic point is this. The, the purpose of sex biologically is intrinsically related to reproduction. Yes. That's what it's for. That's what it's for, yeah. It's not for anything else. That's what it's for. We, we, can, we, we may use it for other purposes and so on, but that's, that's what, biologically, that's what it's for. And th so there's male and female, and they contribute each their own part to that act. And you're being male or female, is given to you by the by your role, as it were, in reproductive activities. It's quite straightforward. Nobody in their right minds has ever actually called this into question. Okay. Now, let, let, let me just let me anticipate a certain objection here, which is people would say, "Oh, what there? There are more than two sexes. There are people who are intersex," and and. There's a number of points. The first one to be to make here, by the way, is that intersexuality, well, it's real, and I'll talk about it in a moment, has absolutely nothing to do with transgender. Most people, most people who are interested in being uh, pushing a transgender ideology aren't intersex or and so on. Has nothing, it, it's no intrinsic connection. But intersexuality is a situation in which people, because of the in utero developmental problems, come, as it were, with a confused raft of biological indicators so they don't have the full range of male or female or they have externals but not the internals or whatever and there are about nine or ten 
maybe slightly more ways in which this can happen. But here's the interesting fact. <laughs> at the most generous estimate, the absolutely most generous estimate, fewer than 1% of the population are intersex. intersex. And there is no correspondence between intersex and transgenderism. These are completely, completely different. Yeah. In, in, in general, the people who, who want to, as it were, change their sex or if men present themselves as women or vice versa, are people whose biological indicators are perfectly aligned. They're, they're not, in fact, uh, the result of some uh, developmental problem in the womb. These are people who have a completely physically perfect uh, binary sexuality. They are men, they are women. Now, and I really want to stress this for the audience, notice this, change their sex. That's, you know, because we keep saying, well, I want to change my gender. Uh, so let's, you know, let's actually, as part of the resistance movement to, to their fight against reality, let's keep saying, change your sex. So mm -hmm. You make the point in the book that this can't be done. <laughs> this is not actually possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and nobody until very recently ever thought it was. In fact, I quote somebody from the 17th century who was talking about the powers of, par powers of parliament. The powers of parliament are, are, strictly speaking, unlimited. They can make rules for the entire world if they choose. Not that anybody will pay attention, but nonetheless, they can do so. But the, so one of the standard uh, kind of limitations was parliament can do as it will pretty much anything except make a man a woman or a woman a man. And I just say you should be living at the star that parliament has done, or at least claims to have done. Exactly. Could, could, could I make it clear? Because some people you know, may, not, may, may not stay with us the whole time. First of all, when it comes to adults, um, sorry, first of all, let, let me make clear. I'm, an, I'm a libertarian, which is to say that um, I believe that people should be free to do and say whatever it is that they wish to do or say, unless it actually causes or threatens to cause physical harm to another human being. That doesn't mean that I approve of it. Okay, and that doesn't mean I wouldn't discourage it or argue against it. It just means that I'm not prepared to have the law uh, be used to force people to do things or to refrain from doing things. So, if a man want, if a man thinks that he's a woman and wants to present himself in that way, I'm not going to stop a person doing it, right? Or if a woman wants to do it, vice versa, and be a man, I, it doesn't bother me, right? From a libertarian point of view. The problem, and I, I keep making this point in the book because I'm going to be accused of transphobia. I don't hate them. In fact, I don't think I know anybody. Maybe I do. But I mean, I'm not out there as it were with a microscope searching these people out to hate them as well. But my point is, I'm really not concerned with that. I'm concerned with what has happened, which is not only can people do this and do I care? No, but the law has now stepped in. And yes. the Gender Recognition Acts, together with the Equality Acts, are now being used to force people not just to tolerate and not persecute people, which is fine, but we must now use the correct pronouns and the correct descriptions, right? Otherwise, we risk, we risk prosecution. We risk prosecution for hate speech or indeed a hate crime. And that is a problem because that is an infringement of my liberty and the liberty of others who prefer, if you like, to think that reality is what it is and can't be changed simply be as the result of our feelings. There is a proposal uh, that Ireland should have a hate speech yes. law. Yeah, it's pretty, I'm told it's pretty advanced as part of the campaign against that. I spoke outside Dolair um, and I had 60 baying left-wing people on the other side of the street, shouting at me for def defending free speech. Off our streets, fascist scum. <laughs> um, I'd have to say I'm very proud of it. I thought I have arrived. You've no, um, made it, Patty, you fascist scum. <laughs> um, I don't want to come to the law yet. That those are really interesting points and we have to talk about it. I want to talk about some of your arguments surrounding the ideas around uh, tran transgenderism and how it's treated. You make the point that as a body dysmorphia, 
transgenderism is treated entirely differently now to other body dysmorphias. Um, and I think that that's really important mm. because they keep denying that this is that there's a correspondence. Yeah, we okay, so so you're right. I mean, there's a whole range of them. And uh, by the way, I recognize these are genuine conditions. In other words, somebody who yeah. who, who, who say, you know, so um so I'm not denying that. I, I'm just saying it is a rather peculiar. So if somebody suffer is is has uh, is anorexic, so it, yeah. whether they're anorexic, they think they're overweight when they're manifestly not, and they've changed their eating habits so they become dangerously uh, underweight, and their organs and their life is threatened. We we understand that these people have a problem. We sympathize with that problem, but our sympathy doesn't extend to saying yes, you're really, really fat and you need to lose more weight. We you say- don't, You don't give anorexic gastric band surgery. Yes, yeah. So, uh, and you know, people who, there's body, body image dysmorphia with other people who think they're really ugly when they're no more ugly than the rest of us, the normal human beings, and want surgery to change it. And again, uh, here, we, we don't, we sympathize, we understand there's a problem, but we don't deal with it by validating the the dysmorphic the dysmorphia yeah, the that the person has who really believe that they have a, a limb that doesn't belong that they should only have one leg and oh, they yeah. should, it should be amputated yeah. we don't offer them in general amputations yeah well <laughs> some in some places yes <laughs> okay. I mean, Let's go we, we are reaching that madness that brings us to that wonderful figure rachel, rachel dolezal or Dolezal, I may mean, not be pronouncing it properly, um, because she crops up in the book, because she's a re her story has really interesting correspondences for the whole transgender issue and raises questions, doesn't it? It does indeed. So, I mean, for, for, again, for, your, for the viewers, Rachel Dolezal is this woman in, I think, the Pacific Northwest, who for quite a number of years was a leading figure in the... Um, I suppose the, I don't know how to describe it, black empowerment or whatever. So, uh, Association for the Advancement of Coloured and Black People. Yeah, that's right, the, the, the NCAA, TP, ACP and so on. And it turns out that, <laughs> that she has white parents and that she's actually, as far as one can tell, white. And this caused a storm. She was thrown out of her job. She, you know, was, and so on. And people said, no, you, you can't do that. Uh, you can't simply say you're black and, you know, just by sort of altering your skin color just a little bit, as it were, and, and adopting the right attitudes and so on. And I'm going, well, there's a, and, and when somebody once then brought up the point about trans, uh, transgender and presented it to one of the critics, he said, oh, don't be crazy, right? And I was thinking, well, hang on a second. There is a difference between it, because if you think about it, insofar as there is any such thing as race, and that's a disputed category, but nonetheless, insofar as there is. By the way, if there isn't any such thing as race, you have to explain how you can have racism, but leave that to one side. Uh, <laughs> um, skin colors, which is the kind of primary marker of whatever is normally taken to be race, runs from the kind of darkest black to the whitest white, to every kind of range, it, it actually does exist on a spectrum. Jim, Jim Connolly's uh, line that the Irish and the Scots are not white, they're blue. It takes them five days in the sun to go white. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. And so, and so the interesting thing is that sort of skin colour, which is the primary marker, as I say, of race, for those who take that seriously, um, is on the continuum. But sex isn't. And here's the bizarre thing. Apparently, you can change your sex, which is not on a continuum, but you can't change your race, which is on a continuum. And that brings us to that defense written uh, of Rachel's position. And Rachel, by the way, still insists that she is black, uh, that she's transracial, and transracial is a thing. There was that defense written by, I think, a lady called Tuvi? Tuvi? Yes. I'm get wrong. Um, which provoked a bitter reaction. And yet, Tuvi's points were in many ways eminently sensible in terms of if we accept transgenderism. Yeah, indeed. By the way, just the name uh, for anybody looking up is Rebecca Tuvel, T-U-V-E-L, 
Rebecca yeah. Chubak. Yeah, so she's a, she's an academic, uh, normally on the side of the right thinking and, the, and so on, not, not, not on her side, not fascist scum like certain people who shall be nameless. <laughs> and uh, she wrote this very considered piece along the lines of making the sort of point that I've made, and she got excoriated. And yeah. the, um, the, the journal which published it uh, apologized uh, in a most cringe inducing apology. Uh, it, the last lines of which are hysterically funny. Let me read you the last lines. <laughs> Having gone through, it says, uh, we, the members of the Hypatia, that's the journal, the Board of Associate Editors, extend a profound apology to our friends and colleagues in feminist philosophy, especially trans feminists, queer feminists, and feminists of color. And then it goes on uh, to say in the, at the end, we recognize and mourn uh, these harms will disproportionately fall upon those members of our community who continue to experience marginalization and discrimination due to racism and cis normativity. The whole is too long to cite, but it's hysterically funny. That last sentence, as you say, is worth the admission fee. You I know? love the morning. I just mourn. I love it. That and cis normativity. Uh, you know, there are things you mourn and silly things like that are not one of them. However, there is behind, you know, I, I find lots of this terribly funny, but there is a, a serious point in, in the Rachel Delays law because that point that, if you like, black activists and uh, colored activists made, that Rachel couldn't be black because she had not in her life experienced the oppression. She'd always had white privilege, is one that the feminists have used about tran the trans women. That's right. And, and in both cases, by the way, it's misguided because um, yes. so here's the point. I mean, I understand why feminists are objecting to transgender ideology, OK, because largely it risks in practice rolling back certain of what they regard as gains, women only spaces and so on and so forth. But the point is that if you base your objection, if you say what it is to be a woman is to have experienced this kind of repression. And I'm going, well, what happens if you're a woman who actually hasn't experienced any of this. Does that mean you're not a woman? It's that's the sound women. Yeah. Or is it or is it or is it is it true is it true as a matter of sort of definition that every woman as a woman has actually experienced this kind of repression and so on, even if they don't know that they've actually ever experienced repression? I'm going, that's a very strange sort of repression. Okay, when it is that you can go through your life without ever noticing that you've been oppressed, especially in a world, well, especially in a world where women, you know, there are special programs for women and you're, you have, you have quotas so that certain women are advanced simply because they're women and so on. I'm going, this is a very strange, if that's oppression, I would like some of it, please. All you have to do. All you have to do, have to do is change. Heels be heels together. <laughs> And again, I, I keep getting very lighthearted about this, but you, you've mentioned, you know, the women-only spaces. There are downstream harms being caused by this really serious stuff. And I wanted to, to sort of talk about some of those. The first one is the women-only spaces. And like, that's everything, isn't it? It's, it? it's women's refuges, but it's also your local camogie team. Yes, and indeed, we saw spectacularly in the Olympics, uh, the, what, I can't remember, his... Laurel uh, Hubbard. Yeah, and so on, who, who mercifully went out. But, you know, um, you, you'll have... You, I, by the way, <laughs> this is, goes to show why you should be careful what you say. Three or four years ago, I was on, I think the last time I was probably on the radio, I was talking about something like this. And I was making the point that if this was a stop, you would find that that men would start and everybody said oh don't be ridiculous <laughs> or really you're doing the same sort of thing this is a scaremongering and i can i'm going well guys i told you so right so here's the here's the deal if i was if i was ranked say ooh, number 300 in the men's tennis i would seriously consider wearing a frock okay Change, going through the gender recognition process and turning up <laughs> and playing with a very good chance, actually, of winning the tournament. Uh, and, and just, just for our audience, under current rules in most Western, especially English-speaking countries, you don't have to cut anything for that recognition. All you have to do 
is feel your woman. Well, yeah, the the situation gets so in in the UK. Now, we can laugh at the at the sports, but if you're a woman who's experienced domestic violence, and that is, you know, it is a problem, and you're in a refuge, you can no longer guarantee that the person in the next bed, the person in the next room, or even the counselor, yeah, is a woman as you know. Woman. No, you're absolutely correct, Patty. This is a really, a really serious, uh, a really serious problem. But what it does effectively, I mean, to come back to the sporting thing, is it, it, make, it makes nonsense of the division between men's and women's sports. Now, look, I mean, women, the reason women's sports exist is not for the sake of men. And you make that point articulately and fantastically in the book. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, and so on. And um, so that, in general, I mean, when it comes to uh, power, speed, endurance and so on the men at the top of the scale outrank women at the top of the scale of course there are women who are stronger than men and so on but when it comes to the top of the scale it doesn't apply for example in things like horse racing say horse racing could be considered a sport sure. only only if you carry the horse and not the other way around right uh, <laughs> okay um but yes, I, I won't, because like um, C.S. Lewis, who said he didn't have, was it gambling and uh, homosexuality, he had never, never did anything, he never sort of criticised because he'd never felt anything about them. Uh, horse racing doesn't do anything for me. I'm absolutely cold about it. So, but I have friends who, for whom it is a central part of their lives. But yeah, but I mean, the point is, look, I mean, whether a jockey is a man or a woman, really, it's irrelevant. I mean, if they can do the job, who cares? Again, when it comes to things like snooker, you don't require any sort of great, like excessive musculature and endurance to push a, a snooker cue. Or darts, as you make the point. But or yes, darts. yeah, or darts, really? or or chess. And yet, and yet, by the way, here's how it works in chess, which is something I'm very familiar with. Women have their own ranks, which are for which a lower rating is achievable for a title. They have their own special tournaments where they won't have to compete against men. And I'm thinking, why? It doesn't take any great. These are heavy. Yeah, I was going to say it doesn't take any great power to to lift the chess pieces or to sit in the seat for hours and end and so on. So yeah, it's quite extraordinary. Um, but the more serious one has to do with women's refuges, uh, women's prisons, for example, because you now there are transgender women, that is to say, men in women's. I want, on that, I want to insert here. Most people will remember the horrific murder of two schoolgirls in Solon uh, by a gentleman. Gentlemen, in Huntley. Huntley is now under a different name in a women's prison as a woman, hmm. despite being one of uh, Britain's worst sex offenders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's a danger to the unfortunate women and the staff in the prison. Hmm. That's an extraordinary position. It is extraordinary. It is. It's truly extraordinary. Now, that's one part of it, the, the, the um, destruction of women-only spaces, which evolved for, as you said, for the sake of women. But there's also the damage done to people who are confused about their sex, gender, they believe that they're in the wrong body, they, they don't feel comfortable, and there are people. But you make the point about the amount of children who go through those feelings and they self-correct. Mm. Yeah, any... I can't. I don't have the figures to hand. It's, uh, I mentioned it in the book, and uh, the, the the stats aren't disputed. Eighty um, percent of boys. Something are... like something like eighty percent of boys or men who think they're they're girls or something will, will come back, and a, a lower percentage of women who think they're men, and so on. But generally speaking, it is it is proportionately disproportionately self-correcting if left alone right if, uh, if left alone but if encouraged and reinforced as it is now for example in the UK uh, then you have problems and it, it, it becomes really problematic when uh, you, drugs are used which can have a long-lasting effect on your psychosexual development and even worse a surgery with the removal of breasts or the or the alteration of the uh, sex organs, uh, so on, which can't be undone. Can't be undone. You make the point that there are two sets of drugs. There are the puberty blockers, which are untested, 
we know nothing about their long-term effects. And then they put they put children as young as nine on these, and then shortly within a year or two, they are then put on reversal. Uh, to girls are put on male hormones, uh, the boys are put on female hormones, and again, the effects of these particular girls are irreversible. Yes, including sterility and so on. Yeah, I mean, really dramatic. Uh, if 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 anything like this were done in other circumstances, I think it's fair to say, Paddy, that people would be talking about child abuse. You make the point in the book, but one of the <coughs> almost definitely going to happen here is that in over a period of time, in in, in our lifetime, quite shortly actually, we will see psychiatrists and doctors facing malpractice suits for the activities they're doing now to children. And that really resonated with me because I had, I got a 60 day ban on Facebook and had the posts removed for saying that doctors and psychiatrists will in 20 years time go to jail for the abuse of children with uh, puberty blockers now and, and unnecessary surgeries. Whatever, whatever about possible criminal action in the future, which is, frankly I suppose is speculative, we don't have to speculate on civil actions. And uh, I can't remember, there's a case currently uh, going through a course where one young woman who went through the chain, including the removal of her breasts and so on, is taking a case against the Tavistock Clinic, uh, arguing that she wasn't properly advised uh, in relation to these matters. And she has so far succeeded and will be interesting to see the case. And that's an indication of how things are going. I don't think it's beyond the bounds of reality to extrapolate towards possible criminal sanctions at a later stage. Certainly civil, civil actions will, will lie. And one of the things we know is that when people won't change their practices for any other reason, okay, a, a possible threat of a lawsuit uh, induces a, 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 a dose of reality. Uh, it, for, for medical procedures, uh, where really that would really have an effect is for the insurers who will no longer cover such activities if there's a danger that in 10 or 15 years time, there's going to be massive payouts. They can't cover let, let me Let me just make this point again, and I think I make it clear in the book. What, what adults do, because when I'm talking about libertarianism, I'm talking about yeah. decisions and actions made by fully mature human beings, right? Yes. I'm talking about adults. Children are not in that category. No. That's the problem. Okay, now, obviously, like anything else, there's a transition. So if you're five or six, you're not in a position to make that decision. If you're 16 or 17, you may be, it depends on your level of maturity, right? But, but, yeah, but. What can't judge that though? It has to have an age gap. An but that's what I'm level. saying. But legally speaking, we can't, we can't go with that. So legally speaking, for example, when it comes to say drinking laws, we have, a, there's a cutoff date. It says you can drink after this date, you can't drink before this date. You can smoke after the state, you can't smoke before the state, and so on. So there's a whole, I mean, the law, the law draws a sharp line. Some deaths. Yeah. So. Yeah, child go on a full bed, but our Minister for Children believes that that child should have access to puberty blocking drugs. Ah, uh, well, yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 it's mind boggling. That's some of the harm. You make a great, a lot of the book is about the legal harms, the, the threat we face, the threat to our free <clears throat> speech, the threat to the women only space from the law. How is transgenderism affecting law? Well, there, there's, a, there's a really, if I can make a kind of philosophical point for a start, if, if we cannot say and express our belief that there are two sexes, it doesn't seem crazy. Then because for legal reasons, you're wondering what the law is doing. I mean, I don't know if you saw just a few days ago, uh, Keir Starmer, the, uh, the leader of the Labour Party was interviewed and he was asked by the interviewer, can, can you say that only women have service? And he said, you, you really shouldn't say that. And I'm going, 
What? Why? Yeah, yeah, because I don't know, it's transphobic or something. Okay, I mean, or if I presume if you wanted to, and I don't want to be gross here, only men have prostate glands. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, now, you know, we're getting into the area of transphobia. Some we people are. of may self identify as women. Indeed, and that's the point. So when it comes to this, it's, as I said, my point really isn't about what competent adults choose to do with themselves. It's what, it's what they're doing in conjunction with the legal system and the media and our politicians, okay, who are now making laws which are forcing us not just to uh, uh, tolerate, okay, uh, and so on, but to valorize, so that we, we, if you, for example, in schools or universities now, I mean, there are instructions that somebody has to say, these are my pronouns, right? And they have to be used. And if you don't use them, you'll be had up for transphobia. And I'm going, well, why not? These are my adjectives. My adjectives are beautiful, handsome, charming, and clever. Okay. And if failure to use these by other people oh. will be deemed <laughs> discriminatory. <laughs> but yeah, but seriously, I mean, it is a problem. Um, and I'm going, so like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? These are, so let, let, let me make this point. Again, here we get a, we get a conflation. Your name is your name. You can change your name, right? I, I call yourself whatever you want, right? I mean, that's not a big deal. And it's a matter of courtesy uh, to use a person's preferred name. So if they're christened Josephine and they want to be called Iguanodon, you know, uh, so be it. I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, but I'll go with it, right? And w apart from extreme cases where it's extreme vulgarity or the name is actually 596 syllables long, okay, yeah. we're, we're, going to, we're going to do it, right? Yeah. But that's polite. But if, if somebody who is male uh, now wants to present himself as female, I cannot refer, by the way, and it's not addressed because it's a third party, I cannot refer to that person as she, yeah. because the person isn't a woman. I would try my best not to use pronouns at all as a matter of courtesy. Which, would, which, of course, the point of pronouns is to make it easier to use speech so we don't have to talk about a person. So I'd have and to it's say... It's very clumsy after a while. It's very clumsy. So it's, I, said, I would say, if, if what she said and so on, I would have to say, if what Thompson said is right, then Thompson is, and I'd have to keep repeating the name again and again and again. But it's quite extraordinary. So, so again, it's not a matter of what you or other people are choosing to do. It's what your choice together with the law is forcing me and others to do and that's this restriction on my freedom yeah. they have a weapon here uh you 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 talk about it very early on in the book which is that wonderful word transphobia mm. uh, and the me you mentioned the media and the media is lockstep on this because the media uses it all the time it is transphobic to do certain things and it's a uniquely privileged word now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, I go through at the start because I, I, it's kind of preemptive strike by me to say, look, I mean, uh, phobia is an irrational hatred of fear of something. Okay. And so let's take the example I give in the book. I don't like spiders. And when it comes to disposing of them, it's my wife who does the disposing, not me, right? <laughs> but I, I don't have an irrational hatred or fear of them. Yeah. I'm not arachnophobic. Yeah. Right. So the mere fact that so the mere fact that I think transgender ideology is problematic doesn't mean that I have an irrational hatred of fear of people who are trans. It doesn't follow. No. Right? And I a, sorry to interrupt, but I think there's another point worth making because you do make it several times in the book, is that there is a basic difference between people who have, if you like, body dysmorphia or feel that they are transgender and transgender activists. Yeah. In fact, um, quite a few people who are transgender just want to get on with their lives and do their stuff and good for them. In fact, one of them, I think her, Debbie Hayton is yeah. that person's name, has, has been in trouble because Debbie Okay, I'm not, I'm not using any pronouns here because Debbie wore a t-shirt at, I think, a union conference that said trans women are men or whatever. Get over it. Okay, And, she, and Debbie, who is transgender, was accused of 
Wait for it. Transphobia. Thomas. <laughs> Which is priceless. <laughs> uh, and has she properly been cancelled? Well, Debbie has been cancelled, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, that still leaves us with the problem of if like there, there are two areas to this in a sense. There's the law, and we I really do want to get into that. But there is that woke cancel culture that the whole the transgender movement has become extraordinarily successful at cancelling people, you know, at going after their perceived enemies. And you, you give several examples of that in the book. Oh yeah, that, no, it's quite extraordinary. But I mean, the, 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 the rhetorical power of just calling somebody by these names immediately puts them on the defensive. And somebody said, when you're explaining, you're losing. You are losing, yes. So, so it's kind of preemptive strike. And yeah. so here, here's my new strategy, Paddy. I want to alert everybody to this. So when I'm going to go in a discussion, in future, that's not going to happen because I refuse to go on the media. But but if ever happened and we're talking, I don't know, about uh, economic supply and demand, the moment my interlocutor, a person that's put on the panel to oppose me, says anything, I'll go, that's racist. And they'll go, what? <laughs> and I go, probably transphobic as well. Okay. <laughs> And You're, I'm gonna win. Oh my God, have I done this? Have I sinned in public? There's, there's, there's no way back. Yeah. There's actually no way back. Once you commit that sin in the modern world, there's no mercy, there's no confession. You are out forever. Yeah, anyway. Um, I mean, I'm joking about it, but it's not funny if you're on the receiving end because uh, no matter how, be it as chaste as I, or, or so pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. And you're, you, you get stuck with this. And so yeah. it turns out that the word phobia is now being used not to describe an irrational hatred of fear, which is manifest in some way, but rather simply the questioning of the doctrine of transgenderism. So even to, even to call that into question is now meant to be transphobic. And I'm going, why is it? So, so like, for example, um, well, let me give an example here. Uh, I, I'm a religious believer, and uh, there I associate with quite a few people who are not. So they're atheists, right? Um, we disagree. I think that they're wrong in their non-beliefs. They think I'm wrong in my beliefs. I don't hate or fear them. I don't have an irrational hatred or fear of them. The fact that I disagree with them on the, what, the, their perception, their, their take, if you like, on the <laughs> ultimate nature of reality um, is a matter for polite discussion between us. And hatred or fear isn't, doesn't enter into it. Yes. So why is it that it's automatically assumed that if somebody calls in, you know, d says, I, I don't think that you can change your sex, that somehow that that is meant to be taken as some kind of threat to the reality, to the existential, to the existence of some some trans person. I don't quite understand how that's supposed it to work. Do you say very early on rhetorically effective? It is rhetorically effective. It, it, yeah. It's been adapted from that, the wonderful use of the word homophobic. That's uh, right. I, as a gay man, I was described as homophobic. Uh, <laughs> well, you're with Debbie there. You are. Debbie can be transphobic. You can be homophobic. And it's rather funny because there's a there's a mirror in my at my back door where I go out, and I always wondered like, should I run and scream as I passed it? <laughs> you know, but you do mention some really egregious cases. I mean, some of them are quite famous. I mean, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. And J.K. Rowling is one. Of, she's a liberal in everything that matters. Uh, she's also an incredibly successful author. And they, they really thought they could cancel J.K. Rowling. Oh, well, yeah. There was, a, there, was a, there was a sign in Waverley Station in Edinburgh, which had I and then heart, you know, I love J.K. Rowling. And it was taken down after her remarks because it said these were controversial. And, and her tweet said something like, uh, present yourself in any way that you choose sleep with anybody who's willing to sleep with you and so on. But men are not men and women, are men. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's, yeah. it's something along those lines. And it, what can I say for that? I mean, the vitriol and the hatred, several, several, public, several authors who were with the same agency that handles their material threatened to, to pull their, their, their books and so on, unless the, the agency uh, got rid of rolling, and to nobody's surprise, they kept rolling, and the others departed. <laughs> yeah, who do you keep? The billion dollar, the billion dollar uh, author, 
the three people who might sell a couple of thousand books between them. <laughs> it wasn't a contest. It, it that. But still, she incurred vast hatred. And I mean, I saw some of the stuff online. This isn't... We're talking about threats of absolute... Violence. I mean, you know, there was threats that J.K. Rowling should be raped. Uh, J.K. Rowling should have her throat cut. Mm. You know, that if you used in any other context would have you not just, would probably land you in a prison cell. Yeah, it, it, there, there's, a, there's a strange a kind of irony, which to a person like myself, who's a cynic, is, is, is kind of amusing when it's not, when we, we know those when you take away the actual harm, but as follows, which is that those who are the first to cry hate and anger and all the rest when you simply question the reality of transgenderism are the ones, certainly on the extreme end anyway, who when they're attacking somebody are full of vitriol and manifest hatred and indeed even well, threats of physical harm. It is quite striking. Yeah, I mean, this was... This was By the way, not, not every... I mean, again, we're not talking about... If like I would suppose the majority of people who are trans who want to get on with their lives and don't want to be involved in any of this rap and are probably none too happy with the transgender ideologists who are, if you like, causing a bit of a backlash against them, which they would prefer not to have. I would also suspect that the first people who are silenced on this, in the same way as the first people who were silenced on the marriage referendum in Ireland were gay people, that the, the ordinary trans people who just want to get on with their lives, who may disagree with the activists, are, are the first to be silenced. Mm -hmm. They will be attacked faster, harder, earlier, and more viciously, because, of course, their disagreement, their heresy, is so much worse. Indeed. Indeed. Now... Sorry, I keep going over and back. And I know I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a, a nuisance in that sense. But well, I'm, Paddy, no, nobody's going to buy the book now because you've told them everything that's in it. Actually, <laughs> I, I've really only, we've only dealt with very small portions of the book. That's, that's the incredible thing. The book is packed with argument. Um, you know, there's, there's stories, I'm not even going to go through. I mean, we, we talked about Laurel Hubbard. Rachel McKinnon, the cyclist, that, you know, these are things that people should read, because I, I think that in many cases, this is a primer for what's happening in their world. This is a primer for what's happening in your world now. I want to come to the, the law and what's happening, you know, because Ireland is at the forefront of this in many ways. It's, it's the, the Irish, the, the 2015 Gender Recognition Act is radical. Oh, indeed, more, more radical than the British one. In Britain still, uh, there is a kind of a two... Uh, now, again, I'd have to check this, but from memory, there's a, there's a two-year waiting and you need to get certification from a physician or a psychologist, whatever, in order to do it. But in Ireland, it's effectively self-declaration. You simply have to sign a form saying that you firmly intend to live as a, quote, man or woman, depending on what it is, and then the minister will sign off on it, and that's that. They are... There's a row going on in Britain at the moment. Um, they, they were planning to bring in self-identification or self and so on. Uh, and they have rolled back on that, at least in England and Wales. The Scottish government, however, is kind of plowing ahead with that so that people will simply be able to, as we have already done, as in many cases, just as in divorce, we went for full scale, no fault divorce without going through any of the previous stages. We went fully for the self-declaration thing on the transgender uh, whereas very few other uh, uh, jurisdictions have done that straight away. I think many people in our audience will not be aware that this is retrospective, that if you declare now <clears throat> the Irish law that you are a different sex, you can have, you will have, you're allowed to have your birth cert altered. I can have my birth cert altered in, this week uh, to, to say that I... I'm a woman. I don't have to shave. I don't have to. I don't even have to put lipstick on. Yeah, you can keep the mustache. Mustache. <laughs> now, that, that's, you know, I can joke about that. But you point out in the book there's a declaration on everybody's birth cert, which is that you can't. You know that. that I, I can't oh yeah, that it, it it is it is a uh, it is an offence to alter or to issue this document as altered, which is quite striking. I call this official forgery, because. The, the even God, on a uh, standard or theology, God is not supposed to be able to change the past, but the government can do so. And I say, well, hang on a second. Again, to come back to the point in terms of fundamentality, there are certain things that are recorded on your birth cert, for example. So your sex, okay, the names of your parents, 
your place of birth and your date of birth. Yes. Right? Now, suppose I had what I called chronodysphoria, right? In, in other words, where, where I, I have this really strong feeling that I was born at the wrong time. And that instead of being born in 1951, I was born in 1972. Why can't I get my birth cert changed to reflect that feeling fact? And there was a case in, in the Netherlands, it's very funny, where, where a man who was 69 said he was, his, his style and his ability to, to function on dating apps was adversely affected by the fact that he was 69 and he really felt 49 and he wanted that reflected. And the judge was in a bit of a quandary and they saw. Um, he didn't win his case, of course. Or how about, for example, suppose you're born, suppose you're Suppose you're born in Belly Snapdash or Mercury, okay, or some strange place, and you think, oh my God. This, this doesn't really reflect who I am. I'm really a more cosmopolitan style. I think I would like to have been born in New York. So I have this kind of feeling fact that I'm really, I'm really a New Yorker. I mean, this is very strong within me. So instead of having been born in Cork in 1951 as a man, I'm going to be born in New York in 1975 as a woman. Why not make all these changes? What's, in other words, you know, there's a serious question here. How come, how come, how come I can, the government will agree to alter the record of my birth to make it that I was born a male or a female as, uh, instead of one or the other? Why, if that's the case, can I not change the date of my birth? Which is surely adventitious, certainly when it comes to a given day. I mean, if you're born at 11.55 on the 12th of December, you could have been born at 12.05 yeah. okay, on the 13th, right? Okay, and indeed, even the, as somebody once said, I was born in Manchester. I had to because my mother was there at the time. <laughs> okay, so so your place of birth is contingent. Oh. I mean, you could, you could have been born in, in mm. Donegal. You could have been born in Roscommon. You could have been born in China. You could have been born and so on. You could have been born in a different day. I'm a New Yorker. But the one thing you couldn't have been born is a sex other than the one you are. And so there's a strange irony that the one ironclad fact about your birth that cannot be changed is now changeable legally. And the adventitious facts, which could be changed, can't yet. Well, I'm, I'm afraid to mention that as a joke because I'm, I'm sure the, the day is coming when so on. And actually, some of the, the, the you see, I, I had this huge problem with the whole birth cert thing um, because we've We've done official forgery now. We now will issue birth certs uh, reflecting that a, a, a child is born to two men or to two women. And the, that is official. The, we, we write out a parent off the birth certs with the compliance of the government. The government does this. Yeah, and it's, it's regarded as a good thing. I call it legalized forgery. It's legalized forgery. It's, it's absolutely shocking. It is? It is genuinely shocking. The law is being altered as we speak around us, and that has effects on our future freedom. In fact, it does affect on our immediate freedom, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, even I had to uh, when I wrote this because this is brought up by an English publisher, and um, I put in a note at the start. I'm finding it now, Paddy. It says, so again, I'll read it if I can. It says, given the current legal environments in the UK and Ireland with their respective gender recognition acts and their various forms of equality and anti discriminatory legislation, I have, when referring to identifiable transgender people in the third person, adopted the practice of using the compound pronouns he, she, him, her, his, her, she, he, her, him, her, his. Because I didn't want to find myself up on, you know, somebody taking a legal case against me in the UK. Our audience is going to find this rather weird, but under British law at the moment, this book could have been banned and Professor Casey could have found himself on a visit to England in court and facing prison. That's where the law is. You do two more things in the book, which I found interesting you briefly consider how this happened, how something that was outsider, almost lunatic, moved to be 
full on state orthodoxy with the people who criticize it and being seen as heretics in the space of what, 10? Five to 10 years. Five to 10 years. How, how did that happen? How did you get there? And the short answer is, I, I mean, I don't really know, but the, my guess, my best guess is that we're, we're looking at a cycle of change which began in the 1950s, the beginnings of the secular revolution generally, the disconnection of uh, procreation from, from sex and sex from procreation, um, the, the attempt to eliminate the perceived differences in uh, status of which of no problem and, and job opportunity is not a problem between men and women, but indeed all aspects of male and female reality were supposed to be, if you like, not there, right? Despite the fact that they're quite obvious as the French say, vive la différence, okay? Um, and so we've seen this happen. The, there are parallels, but the parallels in a sense, if you, if, you, if you take this position having to do with homosexuality, this is something which was legally prohibited, okay? And then in the situation where the legal prohibition remained, it wasn't enforced, it was sort of, then there was, there was de facto legal toleration, then there was sort of de facto social toleration, then we had a decriminalization, okay? And I don't have a problem with any of that. The problem is we've moved beyond that to the valorization, so that somehow being yeah, homosexual- You can end up as someone who lived through all of this and say, I find the valorization absolutely nauseating. Yeah, it's quite bizarre. I mean, like we have, we have a pride week and I'm going, or month as it happens, and I'm going, well, can, can we have 11 months of kind of dull gray flag for heterosexuals? <laughs> Thinking, what is this? I mean, fine if you're homosexual, great, like terrific, but hang on a second. I mean, why is it to be valorized? Yes, exactly. It's quite bizarre. So we went, we went through that, but that took a long time. But, but increasingly, as it were, the, the, the women's movement took longer then the homosexual one took a shorter time, and it's now been further telescoped into the transgender. And I, I, I realize that this is not a complete explanation, but there is, it would be like, there's been a, I, I, try, I try to explain this in the last chapter of the book, which is frankly sort of speculative, but I kind of st stood back from the hurly burly of the legalities and the, the empirical stuff to try and, you know, take a longer view. And so what I'm arguing there is using the work of, the, of a Russian-American sociologist called Petirim Sorokin, who was the first professor of sociology in Harvard, that the, the change between, let's call it liberal and conservative, if you want, but he uses different terms, uh, goes in cycles in various uh, uh, civilizations. And he has, his, he has an extensive treatment of this in his work. It's quite elaborate. As a sociologist, I mean, it's full of data. So he talks about it in the context of Mesopotamia and in terms of Rome and so on. And so you go through these things. And so we, for example, I mean, I, when I was growing up in Cork in 1950, there were people still alive who were Victorians. Yes. They'd been born in the reign of Victoria. That's quite bizarre. And we look back now and we think of Victorianism as stern repression and so on. Well, taking that with a grain of salt because it probably wasn't quite what it seemed. But nonetheless, what people forget is that in the period in the 18th century up to about 1820 and the death of, of George IV, English society was quite flamboyant and yeah. decadent. Yeah. And so what you had was you had a reaction against that in the 19th century, okay? And then you come out at the end of the 19th century, especially after the First World War, and you have the Roaring Twenties. And that period of loosening, if you like, of morals and, and, and attitudes was temporarily stopped because of the events of the Great Depression and then the yeah, World yeah. Wars and so on. And then you go and then you go back down a little dip. And then you come out again in the 1950s. Now, what's interesting about Sorokin's work is that while most people would trace the beginnings of the kind of sexual revolution to the 1960s, Sorokin published a book called The American Sex Revolution, and he published it in the 1950s. And we think it was all just austere. When we think, yeah, we think it was Ozzy and Harriet and everyone was, and yeah, so on. Yeah. And he, he identified in America the, all of the seeds. This is an incredibly prescient book. He identified all the seeds of the coming revolution years yeah. before they actually happened. So what we've been seeing, what we have been witnessing is the working out at an accelerating pace 
of the change in attitudes and morals, if you like, which is the upswing or the downswing, depending on your attitude, from the period, the short period of the kind of Victorian repression as it was generally seen. I believe, in, in fact, we will see the opposite happen. It will come about because in a sense, the insanity is so great and so manifest here that okay. really nobody, you're, you're expected to say men are not women and women are not men. And that's just so crazy, frankly, uh, uh, that uh, it's uh, difficult uh, to see how a society can survive. I, I must remind you that not to say so is a hate crime. <laughs> you can't have that on this broadcast. I know, what can I say? I'm a terrible person. I'm old, I'm white, I'm a man, I'm a Catholic. My God, I should commit suicide. <laughs> of course there is none. <laughs> anyway, Paddy, there we are. Now, those are, I mean, Sorokin is a, is a massively interesting figure in himself. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I hadn't been aware of that part of his work. That's only some of what is in this book. This, this is a, a book that would reward reading and rereading. Um, Making sure to buy it first. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, I think this will look backward. The book we're talking about is Hidden Agenda, Transgenderism's Struggle with Reality. I can only recommend you buy it, uh, read it. Parts of it, and I'm not going to pretend, parts of this you will read slowly. Uh, you may wonder how a man who confesses to have, and I have to say this, did ask Kalinophobia, uh, and <laughs> you can find that on Google, uh, you know, rush to Google for it, could manage a work of such dense scholarship readability as well. Professor Jared Casey, thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to have you on. Uh, the book is wonderful. Uh, I hope it has the effect. Just, just before we go, you do recommend something people can do in terms of resistance right at the end. I do. You do. You talk about actually just saying the, telling the truth. Speak the truth. Speak yeah, the truth. Her. And, you know, at the end with, of the With day, charity and so on, yeah. and without hate and without repute, but, in, but speak the truth. We don't, there's no need for hate. They can't actually arrest all of us. <laughs> Casey, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Patty. Came in, people who left comments, I'm sorry, I didn't actually get to any of them. Thank you and good night. Thank you, good night.